Hi, everybody. I am Carla Roseanne from CLOC, and thank you guys so much for joining us today for our webinar. Um, just a quick mention, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. We are going to have a Q&A after the presentation. Um, if you have any other special questions, you may contact us here directly at CLOC at contact at c-lockinc.com. We are pleased to present a very special webinar presented by Paul Smith today. Paul grew up in a city, at a, but at a very early age, he was passionate about all animals. Often enjoying his trips with his family to the countryside and also going to the zoo on the weekends. He was always drawn to animals and always fascinated by how they um, live, breathe, and what they, how they function. When Paul took his entrance exams for college, his main focus was gonna be zoology. And with a strong recommendation from his mother, he put down animal science as a secondary. And the results came in and Paul missed zoology by five points. So we are blessed that Paul has actually gone into the animal science program so he could um, bring our presentation today. Um, Paul has spent the last eight years as a Welsh scholar, PhD student, and from Chagas Grange, Ireland, and currently registered at University College Dublin. To date, Paul has authored three papers, a book chapter, and six abstracts for international and national conferences. His research forms part of the international collaborative projects, Room and Predict and Master, which he'll go into today. And it is with great honor to introduce you today, Paul Smith. Super. Thanks very much for that introduction, Carla. Um, just want to make sure you can all see my slides just before I begin. So just make sure that's all okay. Everybody can see them. Um, perfect. So, yep. Thanks very much for the introduction, Carla. Um, as Carla said, my name is Paul Smith. I'm a, I'm a Walsh Scholar, a PhD student with, with UCD, uh, with University College Dublin and Chagas. Um, just a little bit again about my educational background. So I studied animal science from 2012 to 2000. 2016 at uh, the University College Dublin, and um, so UCD. After which I took a year uh, after when I when I when I graduated from my undergraduate degree, and um, I then worked as a year as an agri for a year as an agricultural policy officer. So I worked at one of um, Ireland's farm organisations, um, Macron and then in 2017, um, I, I began my PhD PhD uh, with Chagas. And um, again, just before I begin today, guys, I'd just like to thank CLOC for the opportunity to to contribute to this webinar. Um, and get to share with you some of our results that we've collected uh, to date as part of the two different projects, uh, Room Predict and, and Master. Um, I suppose the, pro the, the the webinar for today, guys, I'm going to kind of break it down into mainly three or four different different sections. So first thing, I'm going to give you an overview of Chagas and the work that we carry out, and as well um, a little bit about the, the Irish agricultural food sector. After that, then I'll go into a little bit about the room and microbiome. And then I'll look into show you some of the ways in which we can we can we can look to to reduce methane emissions from from ruminant animals. And then after that, I suppose then what I'll do is for anybody who's who's beginning to use the green feed, I'll just I'll discuss some uh, some advice for them and kind of tips and tricks that we kind of we found as we we've we began to use the green feed. And then just before I begin, guys, I'd like to also acknowledge and thank and thank my co-authors and and supervisors. So. Just a second then. Okay, so so Chagas guys, Chagas is the Irish Agricultural and Food Development Authority. It was established in 1988, and there's three elements to Chagas. So it's the national body for agricultural research, advisory and training services. So those advisory and training services are carried out and provided to to farmers throughout the country. And the Chagas mission is to support science-based innovation in the agri-food sector and wider bioeconomy, so to underpin profitability, competitiveness, and sustainability for the sector. Chagas has about 1,100 staff and just over 100 uh, postgraduate students. So these are uh, made up of masters and PhD students, and these are spread out across 55 different uh, different locations um, throughout Ireland. Um, so these are carried out. In, these are these are based in Chagas research centres and and advisory centres as well. So Chagat has a, uh, on average, has an annual budget of about 160 million, with 75% of Chagat's funding coming from from the Irish Exchequer or the Irish government, and um, as well as monies coming from uh, for the European from the from a European level, so coming from the European Union, and as well Chagas generates about 25 of its uh, of its, uh, its of its income and um, uh, its budget, sorry, true true earned income. So this is monies that are arising from from the advisory and educational services that Chagas provides to um, to to the Irish farming uh, industry. 
percent how that budget is spent so about 40 percent of chugs's budget is spent on on research activities with the remaining 60 percent split between uh, between advisory and education and then um at present chug has about 300 research projects which are being carried out across four different program areas so the main program areas are animal and grassland and research and innovation so that's the program area i'm involved in but then also there's projects which are focusing the crops environment and land use food and the rural economy and development program within chugas so this is just a map of ireland just to show you where the different chagas locations are so each one of these dots um um relates to one of the chagas locations so the yellow dot here in the middle and um, that's oak parks so that's the chagas head office or headquarters um, and that's in that's in our in county carlow in and then i'm based out of chagas grange as carla mentioned so chagas grange is 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 in dunsany and um, which is about 45 minutes outside of dublin in in county mead so this is the, the research offices and, and research center which i'm based in and then as i discussed later where we measure methane uh, emissions but all our methane work to date and um, as part of my two projects has has been taking place at the irish cattle breeding federation project test center in tully um, and tully is in county kildare which is again about 45 minutes um, outside of dublin so i will come back to to discuss icbs role and um, and a little bit later towards uh, towards the end of the towards the end of the webinar. So just to give you a brief overview of the Irish agricultural food sector, so the it's um, the Irish agri food sector is Ireland's large ind indigenous industry and accounts for about seven um, seven point seven percent of the national workforce or employs one hundred seventy three thousand people. We are an export oriented sector with uh, exports arising from the agri food sector valued at thirteen point seven billion um, in two thousand eighteen, and these exports represent about ten percent of Ireland's overall national exports. And currently, we're exporting to about one hundred eighty countries um, throughout the world. So on the left hand side, of the, the pie chart on the left hand side of your screens here guys this is just a, a breakdown of the main products with which um agri-food products which are being exported from ireland so about 50 percent of, of ireland's agri-food exports are coming from from some form of uh, cattle production so dairy being the dominant uh, followed by uh, produce arising from the beef sector and then if we look at the the export destinations and where our agri-food is is destined for throughout the world and um, the uk is a, as our as our closest trading partner and um, accounts for about 40 percent of our of our of our agri-food exports but we're also um uh, exporting to other high value high value um, markets such as the netherlands united states france and china and so on and um, so in terms of ireland's farms we've about 137,000 farms throughout ireland with the average farm size um at 32 and a half hectares um, and then if we look at the main farming enterprises beef uh, some form of beef production and um, dominates as as the as the main farming pro uh, enterprise throughout ireland so 57 percent of ireland's farms are are involved in some form of beef production and then this is followed by dairy and and, and sheep production so in other words about 80 percent of ireland's farming enterprises are involved in some form of ruminant production and then within these ruminant on these ruminant farms and um, most farms operate on a low cost grass based per grass based production cycle so this is due to the fact that ireland has a, the the ideal uh, conditions with which we can grow um, a large amount of grass so basically um with the, the there's a plentiful supply of grass obviously for the room of animals to use to, to use as feed so this this the reason why we can grow so much uh, grass is due to our our, um, our temperate oceanic climate so basically what that means is ireland has a climate whereby the winters don't get too cold but also the winters don't get the, the summers don't get too hot and basically we've a we've a plentiful supply of uh, of rain throughout the throughout the throughout the year so these are basically the ideal conditions with which um, support grass growth so we are able to to grow a lot of gra uh, grass to feed our, our room and population in fact actually about 90 percent of, of ireland's farms uh, farmland is dedicated towards uh, towards grassland uh, production so as we can see on the previous slide as i said um about 80 percent of irish farms are involved in some kind of ruminant ruminant production and um, that's so obviously and uh, ruminant animals have a, have a key role to play in ireland's farming society and not just in ireland but i suppose all around the world they they and um, they do and this is due to the fact that ruminant animals have the unique ability to convert grass and, uh, and other plant matter into high quality uh, meat and milk proteins for human consumption and these obviously these milk and meat protein and um, the source of milk and meat protein also um, contain rich sources of amino acids vitamins and minerals and um, which form part of a healthy diet um, sorry just a second get rid of that um, yes yeah, so as i said uh, ruminant animals can can convert plant matter into into milk and uh, and and meat proteins and this is due to the fact so basically the ruminant animal itself cannot do this and rely and the ruminants themselves and um, the ruminants actually rely on the microbial population within their within their four stomach or the rumen to to break down plant matter and turn it into an energy source for the ruminant animal so that the ruminant animal can use that towards energy so this room and microbiome and um, what does it look like so the room and microbiome and um, 
is basically a collection of microbes which dwell within, as I said, dwell within the forest stomach of the animal. So the the, animal, the, the rumen of the animal's forest stomach is, is, is known as this fermentation chamber, um, which is called the rumen. So, they, so within this microbial ecosystem, there's made up of, the, the ecosystem is made up of five different cohorts of microbes. So there, there is the, the bacteria, the anaerobic phobi, uh, it's anaerobic fun, uh, fungi, sorry, uh, cilia protozoa, methagenoic archaea, and, and, and viruses. And so I suppose it's the three, the three first groups that I mentioned there, the bacteria, the fungi, and the protozoa. These three groups of microbes are the ones that are that are most involved in the in feed fermentation within the room. And so basically they are, particularly when it comes to grass, they are able to produce the enzymes that are required to break down the bonds in between the that connect the, the sugars within the grass plants. So we ourselves, as I said, mammals can't break down the, the beta one for glycosidic bonds, which which are used to um, hold the the, the glucose units and cellulose together, so these microbes uh, are able to produce the enzymes that are required to, to break down those uh, break down those uh, those sugars within grass. In terms of what influences the composition of the the rumen microbiome, so I suppose there's two factors with which influence it. So diet and and genetics of the host uh, host animal. So the so the rumen animal's genetics are also been shown to 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 to, to influence the, the composition of the rumen. So if we look at diet, diet is probably the easiest factor to to look at. So naturally, if we feed a diet high in grass. We are, we are going to see an abundance or an increased abundance of bacteria and fungi and protozoa that are associated with, with the, the degradation of grass in the rumen. But if we switch that diet then to, to say, 90% concentrated diet and we feed that to, to, um, to, a, to a finishing animal, we will then, we will then begin to see um, a flip in the abundance of the, so basically the abundance of the microbes will change and we'll start to see an increase in, in amyolytic bacteria and fungi and protozoa or, or bugs which are associated with the breakdown of concentrates. And then we'll begin to see a, a breakdown uh, or a redu reduction in, in bugs which are associated with grass production. So that's just a quick example of, of how diet can affect the, the composition of the, the microbiome. And for, the, for today's to, uh, talk, guys, I'm going to focus mainly on bacteria and the, the metagenoic uh, archaea. Just, that's just what I'm going to focus on today, just in the interest of time. So in terms of the rumen bacteria, so the bacteria which dwell within the rumen account for the largest proportion of species richness um, of the microbial population in the rumen. So about 50 to 75 percent of the microbial population um, is made up of bacteria. These bacteria can be split into three different subpopulations and these are basically these are bacteria which are associated with the liquid phase of the rumen bacteria which are associated with the solid or feed associated bacteria or then bacteria which are also associated with the epithelium and so that's basically the the the, the, the papillae and the, the room and wall um, and these bacteria are also referred to as the the epimurobacteria in terms of the conditions within the room so most uh, most bacteria within the room are suited to a ph of some in the region of 5.5 to 7 and then the bacteria within the room can be classified into functional groups based on the, the substrate with which they with which they are which they use they degrade and basically use as an energy source for for their growth uh, in terms of the end products with which bacteria produce as part of their fermentation, so they will produce volatile fatty acids, so they're the VFAs, and they will act as the energy source for the for the ruminant animal. But then, as well as part of their their fermentation, they will also produce um, produce some of them anyway will also produce hydrogen and carbon dioxide as as waste products of of fermentation. And I suppose it's it's the role of the metallogens, which I'll discuss now in the, in the next slide. But it's basically their role to to get rid of the this excess excess supply of hydrogen and carbon dioxide within the the room and um, I'll just go say they do that in a minute now but um, yeah basically the hydrogen and carbon dioxide are are, are a waste product of, of fermentation and then also bacteria can they are a key protein source for the for the ruminant animal also so on the right hand side here this is just a diagram which I've taken from Shabat, uh, Shabat et al which would on the left hand side in the blue is basically just shows the, the variety of different substrates with which a single bacteria can use for growth and then in the right in in the orange these are just the these are the the, the end products of that particular bacteria's uh, fermentation so if we take prevotella ruminicola for example we can see that they they are involved in the degradation of a variety of different secondary plant carbohydrates as well as starch and then uh, at the end of their fermentation they can they they can uh, produce sustenate formate acetate and and propionate so it's just to show you just to give you an appreciation of the the wide range of um of, of substrates which can be degraded by the bacteria and the, the, the wide range of end products of which they can produce. 
So moving on to the rumen methanogens, um, as I said, these are the bugs which are associated with methane production in the rumen. Um, so just to start off, they're not bacteria. They belong to the kingdom Archaea. So sometimes you see in papers where methanogens are referred to as bacteria, but that's just, just, to, just to reiterate the fact that they are not. They, are, they belong to a different uh, phylogenetic kingdom, which, which diverged millions of years ago from bacteria. So just wanted to, to, to reiterate that point. Uh, similar to the rumen bacteria, they are also associated with the tree ruminophases. So we'll see that we have methanogens which are associated with the, with the liquid phase of the rumen, those which are associated with the solid phase of the rumen, and also those again which are associated with the, the rumen walls, so the epithelium methanogens. In, in addition, the, the rumen methanogens are also so found to be associated with the, the rumen protozoa, um, and that's due to the fact that the rumen protozoa basically produce a large amount of, uh, of hydrogen um, as part of their as part of their fermentation, so the room methanogens seem to to form a symbiotic relationship with them, whereby they use that hydrogen naturally as their as their energy source. As I said, they're the sole producers of methane, and they do that through this process known as methanogenesis. So on the right hand side here, this is just a, a graph of the of the methanogenesis uh, cycle and the hydrogenotrophic methanogenesis cycle. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but just to, to give you an appreciation again of the the variety of different steps which are which um, take place in it. Um, I suppose methanogenesis. Although it's um, uh, it's a it's a it's a natural part of the the ruminant fermentation process, I suppose as a, a homeostatic role within the rumen. So as I said earlier, it's basically the whole purpose of methane production by these methanogens is to is to reduce hydrogen buildup within the rumen. And I suppose if the hydrogen level gets too at a simplistic level, the hydrogen level gets too high in the rumen, basically this would have a this would have an effect on further for, uh, on further feed degradation and fermentation um, within the rumen. And there is, there's three different um, methanogenesis pathways. So there's the hydrogenotrophic methanogenesis pathway, whereby carbon dioxide and hydrogen are used to produce methane, and the methylotrophic methanogenesis pathway, and the acetoclistic methanogenesis pathway as well. Um, I'm just going to solely focus today just mainly on the hydrogenotrophic pathway, uh, purely due to the fact that this is the, the most common way which methane is produced in the rumen. And so it's a six-step process, and the, the, the final, the, or the, late, the rate limiting um, uh, enzyme which is required for, for methanogenesis is uh, this methyl coenzyme M reductase or MCR um, enzyme. So in terms of the most common methanogen within the rumen, so the, the genus meta, uh, Methanobrivibacter is the most common genus of, of, of methanogen within the rumen. And this, this methanogen can be further split into, into separate subgroups or clades based on the, the presence or the, the amount of uh, isoforms they have of this MCR gene. So the SGMT clade has two forms of the MCR gene. So they have MCR1 and MCR2, they're able to produce both types. And the RO clade is, um, is able to produce only one type of the MCR, the MCR um, uh, enzyme, and I suppose. And the MCR1 is usually associated with a, with a rumen environment that is low in hydrogen, and the MCR2 is usually associated with a rumen environment which has which a high availability of, a, <clears throat> of, a, of hydrogen. And as I said, just again, just reiterate the fact that the rumen methanogens are solely, solely reliant on a constant supply of hydrogen and carbon dioxide from, from other uh, rumen microbes to, to, for, their, for their energy source. So obviously I spoke about this gas methane, so I suppose it might just dwell, del uh, dwell into it a little bit better, um, so or a little bit more. So it's the second most important greenhouse gas in terms of global warming. It is a global warming potential of 28 times that of carbon dioxide. So basically this means it is 28 times more potent to the environment than, than carbon dioxide. It has an atmospheric half-life within around 12 years after which it is which is usually oxidized to carbon dioxide and water within, uh, within the atmosphere and ruminants are responsible somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 percent of, of global methane uh, global methane emissions and as, as i said while it has a homeostatic role within the rumen it also is a, a very um, energetic energetic it's also a very um, energy wasteful process within the rumen as well so so the whole process of methane production or methanogenesis is is estimated to to divert about two to twelve percent of the animal's gross energy intake away from away from animal performance and um, towards methane production so basically in, in around twelve percent of the animal's energy it's been diverted away from growth, milk production uh, or pregnancy and being lost into the atmosphere uh, as 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 methane I suppose now, why are we um, why are we interested in methane production and and uh, why are we not necessarily worried, but why yeah why do we have our interest in it? So agriculture accounts for about 34% of Ireland's national greenhouse gas emissions. 
if we look a little bit further at, at the, the agri-greenhouse gas emissions profile, we can see that just under 60% of, of agricultural emissions arise from, uh, from enteric fermentation. So again, this is the fermentation which is taking, pro, pro, uh, taking place in the rumen. So this, um, the main gas which is, which is originating from enteric fermentation is methane. So we can then look at this another way and say that 19% of Ireland's overall greenhouse gas emissions are arising from uh, enter from um, enteric fermentation. So I suppose when it comes to Ireland wanting to um, to achieve carbon neutrality by by 2050, or indeed trying to uphold our, our our national legal obligations as part of the European Union, clearly um, reducing the 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 the, the the burden of enteric fermentation, the, the emissions about rising from enteric fermentation is going to play a key part in our, us meeting our, our, meet, our, our greenhouse gas uh, obligations. So um, also just to point out guys, um, this figure here of 34%. So agriculture is the, the, the portion of Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions which arise from agriculture is somewhat inflated um, compared to the rest of the European Union. So this is mainly due to the fact that Ireland doesn't have any, any heavy industrial industry. Which, um, which is which is normally associated with with high um, with high um, greenhouse gas emissions. So agriculture that's just the reason why agriculture is so much inflated um, compared to the rest of the compared to the rest of the European Union. So just sorry, just grab a quick drop of water. So when it comes to measuring methane output, how do we do it? So there's mainly three ways with which we can do it. Um, it's, it's the three main methods when we're measuring methane from, from ruminant animals. So firstly, there's the respiration chamber, which was previously referred to as the, the, the say the gold standard, it was previously referred to as the gold standard for, for methane production. So basically the way this 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 apparatus works is um, the animal is placed within these chambers and um, methane emissions are, are the animals methane output so methane arising from 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 flatulence and also that which is uh, eradicated from the animal um, is captured and i suppose the one of the drawbacks from the respiration chamber is firstly it's kind of quite quite uh, quite uh, quite costly to build and then secondly as well somewhat of an unnatural environment in which we're putting the animals into so um previous research by others throughout the world has seen, shown that the animals the animals feed intake drops when they when they're when they're placed within these respiration chambers so i suppose that will naturally enough have an effect on methane production. So if the animal is eating less, there's obviously less fermentation taking place within the rumen, and subsequently there's going to be less methane produced. So, so it's kind of, as I said, it's an unnatural setting and can affect the uh, feed intake. So it's not necessarily always giving us a, a full representation of the, the animal's actual uh, methane output. The second method is the SF6 method. So whereby this, the way this method works basically is we we administer a bolus to the animal with, uh, with which contains SF6 gas, and we can use the the SF6 gas as a tracer gas to to, to estimate the animal's methane output. And um, in terms of the reason, the I suppose the reason why we didn't go with the SF6 method for for measuring methane emissions um, from cattle and our two projects, it can be somewhat of a kind of a labour intensive. Um, um, a labour-intensive method, insofar as these these gas canisters, which are which appear on the animal's back, and um, you obviously to take them off each day as you measure the to, to estimate methane output. The animals can somewhat uh, sometimes begin to kind of kick these canisters off, so it is kind of somewhat of a uh, a tough um, a tough measurement to, tool to use for for the researchers. So that's why we didn't we didn't go down that route. Um, and also there can sometimes be some 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 um, some error uh, brought into your measurements due to the permutation of that SF6 gas from from the bolus that's uh, administered to the animals. So um, we decided to use the greenhouse the, the green feed system for measuring methane emissions um, from cattle. So basically, um, this uh, I'll go into in, in further detail in a pre in a few more slides um, time. But basically, this um, this unit works off voluntary visits from the animal to the unit, so it's it can be used to, to measure methane emissions from an animal in a more of a natural setting. So there's no effect of 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 say um, a reduction of feed intake having uh, having an influence on methane emissions. Also, it's um, once you get used to using the machine and get the animals trained to use it, it's it's quite a labour in intensive uh, method, so it's it's quite easy to use. And the throughput of animals that go through the green feed is also quite high. So we found that we can easily measure methane emissions and carbon dioxide emissions from animal from about twenty to thirty animals uh, at a time. And then when it comes to reporting methane emissions, uh, there's many three ways with which we do this. So there is daily methane output, so that's that's the methane output in in grams uh, produced per day. There's methane yield, which is methane output in grams per day corrected for dry matter intake, and then there's methane intensity, so it has methane uh, in grams per day corrected for um, uh, corrected for for saleable animal products. So, for instance, it could be per per unit of meat or per unit of of milk yield, or um, or sorry, per unit of uh, milk or or carcass weight of the animal. 
So what are the methane mitigation strategies that are available for, for Irish cattle production? Um, I suppose firstly, um, previously within the within the media there has been rumours of um, or suggestions to reduce the, the size of Ireland's national herd and um, national beef herd. So Ireland has about uh, just under a million beef cattle and um, million beef breeding cows within them. Um, Within our national herd, so some of some have come up with the idea of maybe reducing the size of this size no size of our our, uh, our beef herd. But as I said previously, over 57 percent of Irish farms are involved in some form of on um, some form of beef production. So the ramifications this would have on on the overall agri food sector isn't uh, uh, could be quite big. So that's obviously why it's it's it, there's not much appetite in the within the sector to to go back. About just reducing or having our our agriculture or having our, our national herd so that leaves us with two other options for for reducing methane emissions or reducing ireland's methane emissions from from agriculture so firstly we can look at the dietary route so we can look at feeding animals different diets or supplementing them with certain additives so as it's uh, supplementary additives so these can be either synthetic or they can be uh, natural additives which have shown uh, anti um potential so one additive a uh, synthetic adam uh, additive um, called tree nitro oxypropanol so that's up as it's more commonly known that has been been shown to reduce maintain emissions by over 30 percent and in some studies even up to 60 percent when it's when it's added to the diet in minute amount so 40 to 80 milligrams per per unit of uh, Per of dry matter intake for the animal, so that's that is a quite an exciting uh, synthetic compound for reducing methane emissions. And um, next, we can look at improvements of pasture quality. So, in general, animals which graze higher quality pastures will reduce, will have lower methane emissions, and uh, compared to their counterparts which are uh, grazing less or poorer quality pasture. And uh, we can look at seaweeds and supplementing seaweeds into the diet as a method for reducing methane emissions. So, there is actually a project uh, ongoing in Chagas at the moment called Sea Solutions. Which is looking at a variety of different um, seaweeds and the looking at them in vitro. So within the lab, using the the Rusey Tech system to try and see which which seaweed has the the best uh, anti methanogenic uh, uh, potential. So yeah, naturally enough, seaweeds are quite a quite a popular and interesting uh, compound which can reduce methane emissions. And I suppose we can also look at fats and oils. And um, so supplementing, uh, looking at ways to increase the proportion of fat and oil which which we add to the diet. So. I suppose there's two ways with which fat and oil has an effect on methane production. So firstly, fats, and um, they can they can um, target basically they can have a negative effect on the abundance of certain fibre degrading bugs within the rumen. So some of these bugs um, seem to be the bugs which are most um, involved in hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So basically, the fats can can target them and reduce the abundance of them in the rumen. But also a small proportion. Um, of the hydrogen, which is which comes from fermentation, can also get tied up in uh, um, can also get tied up in fat. So particularly the polyunsaturated fatty acids, and um, they can act as an, uh, an additional uh, hydrogen sink within the room. So basically, they will add, they will tie up hydrogen that's available in the room and, and divert it away from the from the methane production cycle. Um, but yet, yeah, it's only a small proportion of hydrogen which uh, which actually gets diverted. Then, but they're mainly the two ways in which fat has an effect on on methane production. Secondly, the other way we can look to reduce our methane emissions um, from from ruminant animals is to go down the animal selection route. So basically, that is to identify and select animals with a reduced methanogenic potential. So basically, yeah, select and breed animals which reduce, uh, which uh, which have a reduction in their in their methane output. Secondly, we <clears throat> sorry. Secondly, we can also look to select animals for increased feed efficiency. Now, I'll go into that in more detail again in a few minutes. But basically, as I said earlier, the whole production of methane is an energetically wasteful process. And um, so, if we can select for animals which have a, a higher degree of feed efficiency, and um, these animals have previously been shown in some studies to, to have a reduction, to have a reduced methane output. So that's that's another way at which we can go with uh, at animal selection. I suppose the benefits of of going down the breeding route are that any benefits will be permanent, uh, will be permanent and accumulative year on year. So we'll start to see year on year, hopefully, genetic gain in terms of reductions in in methane emissions. But I suppose before we go down the breeding route, we do have to increase our understanding of the biological mechanisms which are, which are associated with methane production. So that is indeed looking at the the, the, the link between the, the animal's genetics and the, the composition of the room and microbiome. So that's the, the projects at which we are working on. So I will uh, I'll go through them in a, in a few slides time. And I suppose the ideal scenario is that we'd have an accumulative benefit of diet and genetic selection so that both these two strategies will complement each other and subsequently um, hopefully reduce Ireland's methane emissions. Okay. 
So over the next few slides, I'm just going to just name maybe two or three of the projects which are looking at at diet and um, going in the dietary route and the genetic selection route for reducing uh, methane emissions. Before I go on to go on to our projects, but one of the projects I want to point out to you, which is looking at at the dietary route, is Methabate. So this project is um, it's being led by Professor Snade Water, so my supervisor. Um, and basically, this project has the aim to to evaluate um, a variety of different feed additives. Uh, firstly, in the lab to make to see if they have anti methanogenic potential, and and then any then any additive, then any additives which are shown to reduce methane production in the lab, and um, will then be tested in in sheep and dairy and beef production to to see if they translate from an in vitro model into a into an in vivo model. This project again, looking at different feed additives, will also look to try and look at additives which might reduce the amount of methane, which is um, coming from stored manures and then I suppose they'll also one of the big key elements of this project would be to make sure that any of the, the feed, uh, feed additives that are fed to animals that there's no to um, toxicological um, residues carried over into the, meat, into the milk or or meat which is produced from these animals so basically if a compound is found to reduce methane production we want to make sure that it is that is 100% safe for for consumers to consume that product from the animal so that there's no residues or toxic toxins which are which are carried forward and then another key element of the project is that it will look at um, the cost effectiveness of, of of any feed additives which are which are which are found to have a baiting yeah, potential. potential and then i suppose the, the project as well has a funding um has a 1.3 has a, a funding budget of 1.3 million and is funded from um, the department of agriculture so ireland's department of agriculture and there's also it's in collaboration uh, with nuig uh, afi um, and queen's university belfast so another another project which is currently ongoing, which is looking at the going down the animal selection route, is is green breed. So this is a project again, which is funded by Ireland's Department of Agriculture. And basically, this project is looking at ways to improve the environmental and economic efficiency of dairy, beef, and and sheep production. And again, it's a it's a collaborative approach with with Chagas, the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation, UCD, Carlow IT, and Waterford IT. And this project is being led by uh, Professor Donna Berry. And in terms of say, if we look at the beef side of things, basically what they're trying to do is to phenotype uh, methane emissions from from over two thousand uh, beef cattle. And um, Again, as I said, we can go down the feed efficiency route for trying to reduce methane emissions from ruminants. So as I said um, previously, methanogenesis, it's an essential though energetically wasteful process accounting for 12% of the dietary gross energy intake. So again, it diverts that away from energy which can go towards the animal. So basically animals which have been shown to be more feed efficient. So basically they gain more for less feed um, in terms of their growth or they can put this feed better towards, um, put this energy better towards, towards, towards growth or milk production. These more feed efficient animals have been shown to, to have a lower um, methane production um, and then this is particularly done with a with a trait called uh, residual feed intake i suppose this is just some of the just just as just a few references below so we can see that animals which are more feed efficient and um, tend to have a reduction in methane anywhere from 12 and a half to, to up to 28 percent uh, across a variety of different studies and indeed we've actually shown a lot of the the effects of say the differences of feed efficiency on the composition of the rumen microbiome and link that to 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 and to different diets, and we've kind of shown this in this book chapter, which we produced, and um, which is which is um, which was produced by Professor Sinead Waters, Professor David Kenny, and myself. And that it's um, it's also it's in this book, improving rumor function. So that's just to make you aware if you're looking for further information on the the, the role of the rumor microbiome and proven feed efficiency and the role with the, which this has a pasture. Um, I just I do, I'd point this book out to you today, but obviously naturally, in in the interest of time, I'm not going to have enough time to go through all that today. So I just wanted to make you aware that um, this the, this is more detailed in in our book chapter. <clears throat> so how we're going to link the composition of the the rumen microbiome to feed efficiency, methane output, and host gen and and host genetics. So we're doing this through two projects with which I'm working on. So the first one is rumen predict. So Rumen Predict is an international collaboration which aims to link the rumen microbiome host genetics and phenotype to benefit uh, methane mitigation strategies. So it's funded through Aerogas, which is part of, of Aeronet and Horizon 2020, and has a has a budget of 1.5 million. And there's a variety of, of different collaborators um, included from, from the European Union uh, as well as as well as New Zealand. And the project has a has a, a lifespan of about 36 months, although it has got a slight extension at the moment. And um, Due to COVID, but there's and then I suppose there's three objectives to the project. Um, I'm mainly going to discuss the first objective and a little bit about the second objective today. But the three objectives of the project are 
are firstly to enhance the understanding of the role of diet, host genetics, and the rumen microbiome on environmental outputs, so mainly methane production and, and nitrogen output. Um, and then we're looking to, to discover DNA by DNA-based biomarkers, which are associated with a rumen microbiome that facilitates greater feed efficiency and lower environmental output. And then the third objective, which I won't go through today, is to invalidate um, standard room and microbial analysis platforms for, for international researchers and also just to point out that this this project is facilitated through uh, um, the department of agriculture also has a role in, in, in funding this project as well so then the the other project which as i said the second project i'm working on is master so master is basically going to somewhat follow on from the work with which we the we've started in room predict although it's going to do it on a, a little bit of a larger scale and um, it's also going to as i said it's going to be trying to again link the, the composition of the room and microbiome in beef cattle like 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 room predict but also uh, master is going to look at measuring methane emissions from sheep so and um, this work will be going on in one of the other chaga centers in, in athen roy so in count galway and they will be using the, the portable accumulation chambers or pack chambers to to measure methane emissions from sheep and again this project is is funded from uh, is funded by horizon 2020. so when it comes to enhancing our understanding of the role of diet and um, uh, host genetics uh, on the composition of the room microbiome and environmental outputs. I suppose we're taking a three-tiered approach to, to, the, to, this, to this question. So firstly, we're looking to obviously naturally enough identify animals which are divergent in the level of feed efficiency and environmental outputs. So in terms of feed efficiency, we're going to be looking at traits in cattle um, um, such as feed uh, feed conversion ratio and residual feed intake but then in terms of the the environmental output we're going to be focused on phenotypes associated with methane production and, and nitrogen output and um, secondly the second tier of the project is going to be to identify the key microbes which are associated with these different phenotypes so we're going to be implementing um, protocols and um, molecular techniques such as amplicon and method genomic shotgun sequencing to see what bugs and what genomic detail is a uh, was within the, the room and associated with these different phenotypes and see if there's a difference in the composition of the microbiome between say high methane emitting animals and low methane emitting animals and then we're also going to hopefully look at uh, doing method transcriptomics so we're going to look at the the, the, the activity within the room and so what what um what genes are being expressed again associated with a with a high methane and a low methane uh, methane um, methane emitting animal and then I suppose the end goal of this project will be to naturally in an effort to link the the the, the, the host DNA to the, to the composition of the microbiome will be to form a gene was and hopefully identify DNA based bio, biomarkers which are associated with the, the room microbiome and uh, <coughs> and the, the efficiency phenotypes which I've mentioned so when it comes to identifying the cattle so the cattle which, which we use as part of both these projects are, are housed um um, are housed at the ICBF Progeny Test Centre. So the, the ICBF or the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation is a non-profit organisation in charge of recording and processing of all data in Irish cattle breeding. They have a, uh, a Progeny Test Centre, as I mentioned, in Tully and County Kildare, as I showed on the map earlier. Um, and in this performance test centre, they, they perform a test over 600 beef cattle per year. And um, these, these beef cattle are basically the progeny of a variety of different breeds and sires, uh, which are currently which are currently available for, for um, for breeding uh, throughout, throughout Ireland. I suppose the key role of Tully is to is to measure difficult to uh, to, to measure difficult on farm traits to measure. So these are these are particularly traits which are involved in uh, feed intake and feed efficiency, uh, meat quality, fat scoring, and as well they're obviously now they're measuring uh, methane output from cattle as well. So when cattle enter so Tully, they, they undergo a 120 day finishing period. So the first 30 days of, of life in Tully is, is, is devoted to acclimatization. So basically this is to build the animals up to, the, to, their, to their diet and get them accustomed to their surroundings. And then once the animals are settled on their diet um, and after the first 30 days, they undergo a 90 day um, finishing period. So for both of these studies, we've mainly looked at steers and heifers. So the steers and heifers in, in Tully are on a TMR diet with, of, of 10 kilos of concentrates and, and three kilos of hay. I suppose the main reason which we focus on steers and heifers is, is due to the fact that they're on the same diet. Um, there is some bulls which pass, uh, which pass through Tully, but I suppose we haven't mainly we haven't really focused on bulls too much due to the fact that the bulls are being fed a, a, a pretty much a ad lib concentrate diet. So that's naturally enough going to have an effect on the on the composition of the room microbiome. So to to alleviate any effects or influence from the difference in diet and um, in terms of methane production, we've mainly focused on on the steers and heifers. So to date, there are six green feed units installed in Tully uh, so far. Um, I suppose with ambitions, hopefully, to, to get a few more in. Um, and these 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 green feeds have uh, have come from three different projects. So one's come from Room Predict, one's come from Master, and and four have come from from that other project that I mentioned previously, uh, Green Breed.
So this is just an overview or a snapshot of, of, of the, the Progeny Test Centre and Tully. There's three cattle sheds, so shed one, shed two, and shed three. Uh, currently, there is one green feed situated here at the bottom of shed one, and another green feed situated um, at the opposite end uh, or the top of the shed in, um, over here and there's no units currently in, 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 in shed two at the moment and then also the new shed which which was built um, um, last year and um, shed three this this shed here has a has a four green feed units and I suppose each shed can roughly house about 80 to 100 cattle uh, at one time so they said we're also looking to identify the, the key microbes, the sort of key room and microbes which are associated with, with methane emission and, and feed efficiency. Uh, so how we're doing this, so we are collecting a, a rumen sample and collecting a, a variety of different samples from animals on the last week of the, the animal's methane uh, measurement period. So in terms of to collect the sample of rumen, of rumen fluid, we're doing that via transophical um, rumen sampling using the flora rumen scoop. And we're doing this to, to, to as I said earlier, to, to look at the microbial composition of the rumen and, and look at the activity of the different genes which have been expressed. We're also looking at this to look at um, the pH of the room and, and, and for, for volatile fatty acid analysis. We're also looking to, to validate saliva buccal swab sampling as, as a proxy for, for the composition of the microbiome. So basically the theory behind this is that the oral microbiome should hopefully be able to, to predict the composition of the or act as a proxy for the, for the composition of the rumen and this is due to the fact that during the normal fermentation process or, or digestion which is being carried out by the by the ruminant animal they will naturally they will ruminate or chew the cud or or kind of somewhat regurgitate some of their feed back up into the into the into the into the into the oral cavity so they can rechew the feed but the idea is that when this food is is ruminated or brought back up that hopefully then a certain portion of the rumen bugs will be brought up which are attached to the feed or or and um hopefully which will then begin to dwell in the oral microbiome so that's that's how we're looking to use the oral microbiome as a proxy for the for the meat for the rumen composition and then also we're looking at blood sampling the animals naturally enough to to obtain a sample of host dna and then in terms of nitrogen we're also looking to hopefully get an estimation of nitrogen output from animals and this will be somewhat of a rough um on the spot kind of spot sampling of, of nitrogen output so we're using uh, fecal and, and urine sampling for for nitrogen output and we'll hopefully be able to tie that in as well then with with the with the methane story from each of these animals So as I mentioned, we're using the green feed to to measure methane emissions from 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 the animal and tully, from the animals and tully. Um, I'm not going to go through the the the, in, the the ins and outs of how the green feed works in much detail. I know Scott has has hosted previous webinars, and the others in Sailock have. So I'm not going to go through that in great detail. But basically, the way the green feed works is each animal is fitted with a with a radio frequency tag in their ear. So as the animal approaches the machine, and um, the, the green feed unit will firstly identify that animal, and it will begin to start dropping um, a piece of bait feed. So basically, concentrate or meal will be dropped into a feed dish, and then the bottom of the unit. And I suppose this this is obviously to entice the animal to use the unit and come forward to the unit and keep the keep the animal in place. So while the animal is um, standing there consuming this bait feed, and um, an extractor fan up the top of the unit will be extracting all the air surrounding the animal's head, and then it will eventually this this air will pass towards um, sensors within the which are embedded within the the bottom of the unit, so that we can uh, we can get an estimation of of the animal's methane and carbon dioxide output as well. So I suppose I should have mentioned this very previously. And um, cattle and tully, um, the steers particularly, they after they've gone through this. Um, there's a climatization period. They would then begin a, a methane measurement period of, of three weeks. Um, I suppose to, so we first got up and running with the green feeds. Our first batch of cattle passed and were put on the green feed in June 2018. So this was 20, um, 20 um, crossbred steers, um, limousine crossbred steers with the pasture of the, the green feed at first. And then after that, we with the second we had a second green feed operational, which came from Master. So the first one came from Room Predict, the second green feed came from Master. And this is operational about a year later in, in May 2019. So using the first two green feeds um, up until May 2019, we had data on about 186 animals. And then as we got access to, to the four other green feeds as of this, uh, towards the beginning of this year, and, and then of last year, we've, uh, we've been able to boost our numbers. So at the moment, for particularly for room predict we'll be looking at uh, a sample size of 323 animals so they would uh with a uh, with a room and sample taken from from most of these animals as well so before i kind of go into some of our preliminary results i suppose just 
briefly discuss our discuss our protocol with the green feed and how we use it. So at the beginning during this acclimatization period, I suppose what we want to do is firstly, naturally enough, get the animals trained to use the unit and get them acclimatized and get used to using the unit. So the way we do this is we basically let there be no physical restrictions from the animal um, to attend the machine and we basically allow the, the unit drop and um, feed pretty frequently to them. So the animals are allowed access to the green feed pretty much on an hourly basis at the beginning just to get them used to them to use into units uh, to, to, to use to using the unit and entice them to keep coming back to it and um, so yeah at the beginning we don't mind if one or two animals use the unit at a time so basically again during this this acclimatization period over the four week period and um, they they are they're allowed to do this so firstly we start them off an hourly access to the unit and after which we build them up so that they get eventually on a on a four hourly access to the to the unit and then they then they undergo their, their three week methane measurement uh, period and then before the animals go and test, we then put up uh, put up physical restrictions, and I said there'll be space so that they can only only use the unit every four hours. So we put up this physical restriction here. So we basically put up a gate and a, a bit of boarding here, just basically just so that one animal goes in, one animal comes out. So just to make sure that we're getting a, an accurate recording of of each of each animal's methane output. And basically, so like if another the, the, the whole idea of the white thing particularly is to make sure like if another animal standing around the standing close up, this fella standing close to to the unit where we have an animal in place, is to somewhat kind to block away any um, and and divert any interference away from away from the animal. So yeah, previous so I suppose we kind of first in Tully we were the first ones to say maybe get using the green feed system in Ireland, but then Katie Starsmore and Lawrence Schlu in Chagas Moor Park have um, have started using the green feed also at pasture. So most of our work is focused on green feed indoors but just to make you aware that in Ireland there is methane emissions being collected from from animals at pasture. Um, I suppose if you have any really, really detailed into, uh, questions in terms of uh, the, the, the green feed of pasture, I suppose Katie might be the best to, to contact the, but um, this is just again, just to make you aware of uh, that this work is currently ongoing, uh, ongoing within Ireland. Um, and again, similar to our own work, so the cattle, I suppose, are somewhat trained to use the green feed indoors and they're allowed access to the in the, to the unit indoors so during the winter period and then when the animals go out to pasture uh, the green feed is put onto a roadway and basically moved along the, the to, to, to accompany the rotation and grazing pattern with which the animals are which the animals are going on so this is just to say the, the, the setup that Katie Lawrence and and Ben also have down in down in Moor Park for measuring methane output um, from animals at, at, at pasture. As I previously mentioned I suppose this is just this is kind of key and um, so we we allow the animals only four hourly access to the to the green feed unit, and I suppose this is to make sure that we capture the diurnal pattern of methane production. So basically, throughout the day, methane emissions will go up and down, as we can see through these graphs here. So the first graph is coming from from the data which is collected from from Moor Park, and the bottom graph is it's just plots coming from from the data collected from Tully. But basically, as the animal throughout the day, as the animal eats more feed, basically methane emissions will go up. So we can see kind of in the early hours of the morning in both graphs, methane emissions seem to be at their lowest then obviously as the animals are allowed are uh, put into a new pasture into a new into a new paddock or the animals get fed in tully and um, we do start to see that the methane emissions do somewhat do somewhat kind of kind of increase so when it comes to measuring methane emissions from from animals we want to we want to make sure that we get a we get a spread out measurement and um, spread out the measurements throughout the day to basically make sure that if we take all the measurements during the early hours in the morning we'd have an underestimation of methane output but then if we took measurements towards the end of the day or just about three or four hours after the animals have eaten then we'll have an overestimation i suppose of the animals methane output so this is key this 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 spacing out of the of the, the visits to the green feed is key just to, to make sure that we get a, a proper average of the animal's output um, throughout the day. So next, um, sorry, just another drop of water. And um, just before we, so next, I'm just going to show you um, some preliminary results which we've collected to date um, from our work in Tully. Um, I must stress that these are preliminary results. And um, but yeah, again, these are these are just what the results are starting to look with um, so far. So as I said, we collected data on about 300, 320 animals so far, but I'm just going to mainly focus on on about the, the data collected from the four main breeds and um, which have passed through Tully. So we've mainly seen data um, limousine cross animals, Aberdeen, Aberdeen Angus cross animals, Charlotte cross animals, and Cemental cross animals. Animals passed through Tully uh, in our time. Um, I suppose the main reason that limousine is the we have a greater proportion of limousine animals compared to the rest. This is mainly just due to the fact that this happened to be the most popular breed uh, passing through Tully during our during our test period, um, and then we pretty much have a 50-50 split in terms of the animals um, uh, within each breed. So these are again some of our preliminary results. So yeah, cattle, um, when the cattle are getting their methane measurements um, taken from them, they're about uh, 15 months of age. 
and they have a body weight of about 508 kilos and they're eating just under 10 and a half kilos of dry matter uh, per day and then in terms of daily methane output and um, these animals are producing about 237 grams of methane per day and they are producing 8.7 kilos of, of carbon dioxide per day as well and when we correct that methane output for, uh, and for, for dry matter intake and report it as methane yield these animals are producing 22 grams of methane per kilogram of dry matter intake and then in terms of methane intensity so we've been actually I've been using um, methane per unit of body weight as a sort of proxy for methane intensity so um, instead of carcass weight we've been using body weight and as I said just as a proxy but we can see that the animals are producing about 0.47 um, grams of methane per, per kilogram of body weight. If we split this then based on heifers and steers, and we suppose the steers are about a month and a half older than the the than the, the, the heifers when it comes to measuring the when it comes to, to getting their methane measured. And I suppose naturally then this is why we're seeing the, the increase in body weight between between the two cohorts of animals, and then subsequently that, that 30 kilos of of difference in body weight is, is resulting in the, the increased uh, feed intake coming from, from the steers. And I suppose this is then having an effect on, on daily methane output. So we can see that the, the steers have a slightly higher methane output, about just under 8% compared to the heifers. But this is mainly being driven, we can see that this is mainly being driven by the difference in, in both age, body weight, and feed intake of the animals. So when we correct the um, methane output for, for kilograms of dry matter intake, we can see that there's pretty much no difference between the two cohorts. And similarly, when we correct for per unit of body weight, again, we can see, we can see a similar story. So I suppose one question which would be key for, for overall genetic selection um, in terms of reducing methane emissions from, from, from cattle is will these uh, reductions in methane have an effect on non-farm on uh, profitability? So for, to, to estimate this, um, we've been using the, the Eurostar breeding index, which is produced by ICBF. So this is basically a breeding index to allow farmers to, to select more profitable animals. Um, and this index can then be split into two sub-indexes. Um, so there's a terminal index and the replacement index with both indexes being used for for, for different purposes on farm. So naturally the replacement index says for, for breeding replacements on farm, and then the terminal index is for, elect, for, for selecting animals which are which are going to be finished. Um, so yeah, so we are starting to see, and again, this is preliminary from our data so far, but we are, and again, this is only collected on 320 animals so far, but we are starting to see this trend whereby animals would reduce methane intensity and perform better on the, the, the Eurostar terminal index. So there is this negative correlation of, 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 of minus uh, 0.3 starting to originate between the methane intensity, again, that's methane per unit of body weight, and, and the Eurostar terminal index. So I suppose this is kind of somewhat of a, a bit of a good news um, trend which we're starting to see. So I suppose it kind of shows that with the with the terminal index there we can start and um, there'll be a benefit towards the farmer because naturally enough they'll have a more profitable animal. But also in terms of I suppose from a sectorial point of view, uh, if this trend continues, we'll start to see that that hopefully um, the more profitable animals will also be producing uh, producing meat more uh, more efficiently. So just before I finish up, guys, just um, just a little bit of advice for anybody that's embarking on on using the green feed system for for measuring methane and uh, methane emissions from cattle. I suppose the first thing to do is to encourage the animals to use the unit from day one. So basically, start training the animals and get them used to using the unit. So the way that we do this during this acclimatization period, or when the animals are first given access to the unit, what I usually do is I throw a bit of a bit of concentrate feed on the ground and within the feed dish, and just basically just to get the animals interested and get them used to approaching the unit and just kind of build their interest up in it. And um, so once, and as well as I said, we allow the animals to have pretty frequent access to the green feed as well during this stage. So as I said, the animals are allowed roughly access to the unit every hour at the beginning just to again start enticing them to use it so once we chucked a bit of bait feed and one or two animals start using the green feed just just pretty much leave them be they seem to i know it sounds kind of corny but they do seem to kind of to learn off each other and and benefit off each other in terms of visiting the green feed so yeah once they kind of get a few of them that start using it the rest of the the group or herds those seem to, to seem to follow suit and um, in terms of when you're setting up your pen i suppose do spend a bit of time and effort in designing your pen so i suppose you'd want to set up which i'll show um set up of Tully now the Tully one we kind of fluked a little bit this is the way Tully was always set up but I would um, stress that anybody who is setting up pens within Tully to, to do spend some time and um, an investment in it and um, so this would be key for when you begin to doing work with with the unit so when you're carrying out cl uh, calibrations or 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 indeed cleaning the unit you obviously want to be able to shut the cattle away and um, there is a test with which you'll see if you when you get the green feed it's called the CO2 test so basically we use a canister of CO2 and pass it through the, through the unit to, 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 to calibrate airflow and um, just make sure when you're designing your pen that you do have access to a plug which is close to the green feed but also make sure that this plug 
rock um, is somewhat sheltered away from the wind, so you'll need to use the weighing scales when you're when you're measuring your when you're weighing your carbon dioxide cylinder. So ideally, if you have this in a sheltered area that's near the green feed, um, it should make your measurements go a little bit um, a little bit easier. I suppose then naturally enough, do make sure that all wires and tubing is, is kept out of reach of the animals. And um, even if you think that they are, double check it again and really make sure that all the stuff is secure because they do seem to be able to to get at it and they will they will chew it as well. I suppose yeah again this is this is the setup in the pens and tully as i said i suppose it's key that you have some kind of way that you can lock the animals out so we have a green feed down the bottom of the the, the shed here so like if i want to do a little bit of work like as you can see with this gate here i can lock the animals out and, and begin doing the, the work on the unit i suppose as well what we can also do if there's some animals that aren't using the unit or at the beginning if we want to get the animals closer to it we can we can pen the animals as well so that they're a little bit closer to the unit so just to, again get them used to using it as well so just as i said again just to reiterate do put a bit of effort and, and time into into your pen design before you before you embark on your journey with the green feed and um, finally uh, secondly sorry almost done but um just make sure that your your alleyway is sturdy but changeable so as i said we have this alleyway at the beginning we have no physical restrictions to the to the, to the green feed to 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 again just get the animals used to using it but then eventually we do have a system set up whereby there is a physical gate put up so when you are designing your alleyway for for the units and um, just make sure that it is interchangeable so you can take this off at the beginning to make sure the animals use it but then you can also put it up when the animals go and test to make sure you have one in one out system and finally just some last minute tips and um, regularly clean the feed dish so when you do get your green feed you'll see that the feed dish there is little holes in it to, to allow air pass through it and you naturally don't want to let those get clogged so do clean your clean your feed dish regularly to make sure that these stay clean and um, if you do take the feed dish off the unit to give it a clean be careful of the styrofoam attachment you'll see attached to the to the feed chute and um, that's there for a reason so 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 if it does come off don't just chuck it out please do put it back on your green feed and um, it will save you an extra bit of time in terms of cleaning so basically that's styrofoam is just to make sure that no dust or blowback comes from comes from the unit and um, so yeah do make sure you reattach that styrofoam piece if it does fall off because it will uh, it will result in your your filters and your unit getting pretty dirty if it falls off and uh, yeah just make sure the dishes are, are reasonably clean before you return it to the uh, reasonably dry before you turn it to the unit i suppose over time and um, first you have a stock of isopropanol available near the unit and this would be just used to clean the the, the, the airflow sensors and um, but also trying to accumulate parts over time so it'd be that little connections of the filters and um, or again for 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 yeah different bits of tubing and stuff like that i suppose that's just if you naturally have an animal that's on test you don't want if something happens to in the in the unlikely event that something goes wrong with the unit you just want to have a, a particularly have a, a spare pair a spare parts available to you so that you can get your unit up and running over time so just do try and accumulate them and uh, thoroughly dry your air filters before you put them back in so we wash our air filters with water so do thoroughly dry them before you put them back into the unit because again naturally this will have an effect on your airflow and um, it sounds again a little bit trivial but but do read the manual and methods papers which are associated with the green feed and this is particularly um while it's not an overall complicated piece of unit to use once you get used to it and um, this is just to get your to wrap your head around the different calibration and the purpose with which you're carrying those out and um, so yeah do read the manual at the beginning and as i said refer to methods papers to to get used to the unit and um, again uh, if you do happen to carry out any repairs particularly those which are associated with the computer elements of the of the unit do take some pictures before you carry out those repairs because obviously you can see there's a lot of connections and a lot of wires that go along with the computer of the unit now green feed uh, sorry c lock will send you on pictures of the unit and uh, and uh, the elements of which you're changing if you have to carry out any repairs but but do just take pictures just for your own sake just in case you in case you lose those pictures or anything else and then finally again just listen to the experts so i've always found sealock to be quite helpful if we've had any issues or if i needed any advice when it came to setting up the the unit so do listen to the experts and and and, and ask them for their advice and just just yet just to finish up guys so this is a little bit of project outreach from from our two projects so data from room predict and master has been presented at a variety of different products uh project uh, sorry variety of different conferences and uh, one of the main ones being the the global greenhouse and animal agriculture conference in brazil last year and uh, we've also presented our data at, at chagas open days and, and indeed icbf open days as well and contributed to a variety of different research articles and the newsletter and um, as well i also put up regular updates on on my twitter page and um, so if anybody's interested in the project please do give me a follow and then we've also uh, posted our or contributed articles to, to the national media and to the icbf website and the microbiology society blog page as well and as i said we've also produced uh, a book chapter as well
and then these are just a few references guys if you're interested in finding out more about Irish agriculture and um, these are available from the Department of Agriculture and the Chagas National Farm Survey and then these are just some 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 good papers in terms of if you've an interest in feed efficiency and also this is just a reference to our to our book chapter as well. And then finally, just before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank everybody which has helped out with the project, uh, helped out with the two projects. So particularly in Chagas, I'd like to thank my two supervisors, Sinead and David, for all their input and advice in the in the project and uh, and help throughout the project. And also thank um, Dr. Mark McCabe as well in the lab for all his input and help with the molecular analysis. And um, I'd also thoroughly like to thank Stuart Kirwin um, and all the Grange farm staff for all their help when it comes to animal sampling as well as without them we wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to get our microbial samples or rumen samples um, and I'd also like to acknowledge and thank my other supervisor uh, Dr Alan Kelly from UCD in terms of ICBF I'd particularly like to thank uh, Dr Stephen Conroy and Dr Andrew Crummy for again their input into, into the project um, and then and then also uh, thank Katrina Scanlon for, for all her help with data flow and also thank Brendan O'Shea and, and Jamie Ferry as well for all their help out on the farm and naturally as well I'd like to thank and acknowledge all the project partners as part of Room Predicted Master as well and then I suppose without without uh, without funding we wouldn't be obviously naturally be able to carry out this work so I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Department of Agriculture, Aeronet and Aerogas and, and Horizon 2020 for, 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 provide, for providing us with the funding to, to carry out these projects as well and finally I'd also again like to thank um, thanks CLOC for the opportunity to present some of our, uh, to present some of our data here today. In particular, I'd like to thank Carla for for giving me the opportunity to 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 to, to, to present at this webinar. And I'd also like to thank as well, particularly yeah, Scott and Mike for all their help with with data flow and any issues that have been having with the green feed as well. So. Thank you very much, guys. I suppose as well, thank you to all of you for, for your attention here today. I know I've kind of rambled on for a little bit, but if you do have any further questions um, or want to learn more about either our projects or get in contact with me, there's my details down below. So so please do get in contact if you have any further questions and, and I'll hopefully be able to answer for them. So thank you very much, guys, and appreciate your time. Awesome, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we do have about eight or nine questions here, um, and as a reminder, if, if you do have any questions that you come up with uh, from here on out, go ahead and just post them in the in the chat, and we can read them as we get to them. Um, we did have a few people that wanted to know um, if the video is going to be available, um, and also if the slide deck is going to be available. Yeah, so I think yourselves might be able to hopefully be able to put this video up on the website. But yeah, I can I can put these slides together into a PDF and and send them a lot, uh, send them on, send them on to yourself, Mike, and you can put them up on the website. Yeah. All right, great. So, so if anybody uh, that I have not already talked to does want the recording or the slide deck, uh, go ahead and just um, say yes in the chat, and we'll be sure to get you a link uh, once we get it all posted. All right, here's the uh, first question. Um, and this came up uh, somewhere in this about 10, slide number 10. Um, if we okay. could avoid archaea work of producing yeah. methane, how could we avoid the building up of hydrogen concentration in the rumen? Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's a nice one, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I suppose we'd be looking at trying to come up with an alternative hydrogen sink within the rumen. And, but I'll be honest with you, I don't particularly think that we will probably ever come to a to to a scenario whereby the archaea aren't there and they're obviously there for a reason within the room and, and that reason is to is to, to 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 alleviate the methane production to alleviate hydrogen and carbon dioxide what we can hopefully do is 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 alter the population within the of the methanogen population so we can hopefully gear it towards towards and um, microbes which um, produce less methane so as i said there's that difference in the in the methanobrevi vector and the two clades so if we could hopefully come up with feed additives which will which will um which will increase the abundance of maybe the RO clade, or again, again alter the, the methanogen population in a different way. Hopefully, we could we can work around the scenario whereby we have uh, we have bugs which will produce less methane in the room. I don't think we'll ever thoroughly get rid of the archaea. As I said, they are part of the they are an integral part of the system. But I suppose the the whole Bennett, the whole idea will be to try and focus on a way that we can we can just select for the the methanogens which will produce less methane. All right, Hopefully, great. that answers that, that person's question. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Um, pretty, pretty simple question. Uh, range per day methane production per animal? Yeah. 
range or the range per day, sorry, in um, in terms of what the, the difference is in the animal. So we're seeing about there's a 20% difference in terms of the, the methane emissions from the animal. So that can go anywhere up from of about 300 grams a day to, to the below um, to about 150 grams per day as well. Yeah, and around that's kind of somewhat of the range that we're seeing from the animals today in Tully. Um, actually, it'd be a little bit higher than the 300 grams. I just can't remember the figure off my head, but I think it's somewhere around about 320 grams per day to, to about 150 grams per day is what the animals are producing. That's roughly about the range uh, from Tully. From the Tully data. Okay. Yep. And I'm just reading these questions. Um, almost yeah, no, okay. them, so. <laughs> All right. Next question. Uh, is there any research on emissions on animals eating diverse swards or grazing on upland platforms? Yeah. So in Ireland at the moment, I'm not aware of any work that's currently ongoing in terms of diverse swards. And um, I think there is interest from a few different parties as will hopefully begin to start doing that. And again, hopefully they might start using the, might start using the green feed, uh, green feed to start measuring um, these methane emissions. But previous work in Chagas, say if, say looking at swords that contain white clover, and they did use the SF6 method. They have found that that uh, the, the dairy animals grazing uh, white swords containing it. 24% white clover content. These animals that uh, grazed the clover swords had a 12% a reduction in methane yield. Um, so again, that's methane yeah, and, and corrected for dry matter intake. So the, the dairy animals, the, 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 sorry, the dairy cows grazed in the white clover swords had a had a reduction in methane yield of 12 of 12% compared to their compared to their counterparts that are grazing uh, just just perennial ryegrass pasture. And then subsequently, as I said, this work was previously carried out in Moor Park, uh, Chagas Moor Park, but we've also looked at the the effect this had on the rumen microbiome. So there was rumen samples taken from from those animals, and then um, we've seen that the 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 animals which were grazing the clover swards. Had an alteration in the in their methanogen profile compared to compared to the animals grazing the grass swards, and also there was a difference in the bacterial population as well, which we which we think might have been uh, might have been driving that difference um, that difference in methane yield. And we actually have a paper on that um, which is currently available in a uh, scientific report. So if if anybody wants more detail on that as well, but in terms of upland look up, upland research in Ireland, I'm not fully aware of any that's happening currently to date. I think there might be some happening in Scotland, but I, I can't be 100% sure what uh, what what uh, organisation that is again. So I just I just won't comment on that just just for the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question is: Is there a difference in methane emissions for cattle fed on concentrate diet versus grass diets? Yeah, so as a rule of thumb, usually the higher the quality diet um, will will subsequently result in a in a reduction in methane emissions. So so usually what we see is animals which are grazing uh, which are say um animals which are which are um sorry on a concentrated diet will tend to have a reduction in, in methane production compared to the animals which are on a pasture based diet. As, as I said, as a rule of thumb, and this is mainly due to the fact that when we when when the animals great when the animals being fed a concentrated diet, basically a lot of the, the VFA profile is being altered towards propanate production. And propanate production acts as an additional hydrogen sink in the rumen. So basically this will divert away any uh, divert away the hydrogen away from, from, from methane production. And again, when we feed animals concentrates, obviously this will have an effect on, on ruminal pH. And when the ruminal pH drops ever so and uh, drops a bit, that will not, that will have a negative effect on both the, the methanogen profile and also on some bacterial members as well, which which should look, result in a reduction in, in methane production as well. So yeah, as a rule of thumb, basically animals which which are on a say on a full concentrate diet compared to animals which are on a pasture based diet, the animals on a concentrate diet will have a will have a reduction in in the methane output. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question. Probiotic can reduce methane production in the rumen? Question yep. mark. Um, yeah, question mark. Yeah, so I suppose the idea behind that would be that we, when you when you'd feed a probi probiotic, we'd be hopefully looking to again put in um, more favourable bacteria, so particularly bacteria which are associated with 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 uh, lactate production in the rumen. So there is, I think, a bit of work going on that and um, going on that in Chagas and Munda Chagas centres, which has been looking at probiotic feeding as a, as a way of basically altering the the, 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 the room and microbiome. So again, as I said, selecting for these bacteria which are associated with lactate production. And again, what we do is if we put more lactate producing bacteria in the room, this lactate then can go on and be used by other marumen microbes to, to to produce propanate, which again will alter the which will, will will act as an additional hydrogen sink in the room. And so that's the way that probiotics can be used and um, can be used in the room. Okay, 
Next question, did you evaluate the impact of pasture quality on BFA's molar proportions and the relationship with methane production? Um, I haven't done that yet, no, no. So as I said, the pasture, the pasture work is currently being carried out by 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 Katie Starsmore and Lauren Schlu, um, in Chagas Moor Park. So I won't comment on that because that's not say my 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 area of, of of work at the moment. But I presume that I suppose that work hopefully will be ongoing. So hopefully in a few months' time or in a, or in a year's time, I suppose when when more data is collected from Chagas Moor Park, hopefully they should be able to, to be able to answer that question in more detail. I know in terms of the the animals that were grazing the white clover swords and um, BFAs unfortunately weren't available and the BFA analysis wasn't available on those animals unfortunately. Alrighty, uh, next question. What proportion of methane emissions come from stored manures? Yeah, I'd have to, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm kind of pulling a blank on that one. That is something that I would have to, to look up again. I'm not going to, I'll be honest, I'm not going to lie and come up with a figure and um, to, to figure to someone uh, that is, I'm actually just have to pull a blank on that one. So I would have to, to look up that one. If, if someone wants to shoot me an email, I will, the person that asked that question, I will, I will look that up for them and, and get back to, get back to them on that one. Apologies about that. Uh, I'm just pulling a blank on that, on that, on that factor at the moment. Okay. And yeah, we, we do have that person's email, so we'll uh, be sure to Perfect. get yes, in contact with them. Um, 100%. Next question, um, is methane emission intensity in low and high methane emitters associated with the uh, microbiome composition? Yeah, so we're hopefully going to look at that. As I said, we've collected all these rumens and um, these rumen samples from all the cattle that have passed through Tully. And I suppose at the moment, the, these samples are, I'm, I'm, I'm currently analyzing those samples in the lab. So we're at a stage where all the DNA has been extracted from these room and samples. And I'm currently um, basically preparing a uh, next generation sequencing libraries so they can hopefully be sequenced. And once these 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 samples have been sequenced, then hopefully I should be able to answer that question in, in better detail. And um, so just at the moment, we just, we haven't got that far in the project just yet, but I'm hoping that the early part of next year, that that that, that data should hopefully be available and we should be able to, to link it. I suppose since there is a difference in the methane output between the animals, I suppose we would select, we would, I would uh, um, suspect that the animals which have a lower methane intensity should should have an alteration in in their in their microbial population. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we have a lot of people saying Super. thank you for the presentation, and Super. I, I, I'll thank add myself to that. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Next next question. Um, can I, or sorry, uh, is the R equals minus 0 0.3 encouraging to keep using the methane intensity per terminal index relationship to breed low emitters? Yeah, so if I'm interpreting that person's question correctly, so basically that negative relationship, so the way it's looking at it is that the animals that are that are more profitable, um, so we're starting to see, so basically as, as methane emissions go down, so we've seen that the graph was, was, was looking down at that type of a way, so basically the way it was working, sorry, I should have said that the, the profitability was down the bottom of the graph on the y-axis and on the x-axis, was well, the animal's methane intensity, so the animals with a lower methane intensity, so those again are the animals which are which are producing less methane per, 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 per kilogram of body weight, and those animals were starting to see a trend where those animals tended to, to perform better on the terminal index. So yeah, that was a, that negative correlation would be supportive of, of more profitable animals. And um, again, that's a trend that's starting to emerge from the data. But that, yeah, that will be indicative of uh, the animals which are performing better on the on the, the the terminal index. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there are a few a few questions that are more. I think they're going to be a lot more in depth, than uh, we might need super. To talk with them one on one but um i guess yeah. one one more question that came in um and kind of has to do with your vfa can methane production be predicted with vfa production yes yeah, so again that there is a bit of work that's kind of going to have to go into that but yeah so in general what we'd see is as the the the, the proportion of propanate in the room and goes up and um, we tend to see a reduction in methane production and um, so i don't think offhand if it can be done just yet and um, i suppose there will be some some modeling figures that you could use or some formulas with which would we be able to use for predicting methane emissions we can certainly do for predicting hydrogen output and um, so i suppose we could get an estimate and um, but um, um i suppose that is kind of that's the modeling end of things isn't it? i suppose my, my area of expertise and um, I know there's a group saying in red that's that is that is focused on that so hopefully um hopefully um 
as room predict further pro uh, progresses, we hopefully should be able to have maybe a way that which we can we can we can come up with a way of predicting uh, methane output in terms of the animals' uh, volatile fatty acids. But basically, yeah, usually what we see is as propanate production goes up and acetate production drops, we tend to see a reduction in methane emissions. And subsequently, if the opposite happens, we tend to see we tend to see uh, an increase in methane production as well. And I suppose the story with volatile fatty acids as well that is also going to be we're also going to have to factor the type of diet that the animals on as well when it comes to when it comes to that story as well so i suppose at the moment i don't have an answer for that one just yet but i suspect there should be a way of modeling that and um, hopefully in the future all right thanks for that uh sure. it looks like we've got all the the questions answered at least the ones that um don't have a, a long in-depth discussion yeah. so um so we, we we do have all these questions recorded and we will forward them to paul so he can um, either contact you or uh you know get an answer to you somehow. So um, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Paul. Super, thanks very much, guys. And as I said, if you have any more information, uh, any more questions, do please uh, do please get in touch. So thanks very much again, C-Lock, for, for the opportunity as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul, again. Super, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Super.